ora te whanau, tēnā koe ko Scott Pilkington aho. Welcome back to our Cafe Scientific series and for our first session of the year. For those who don't know me, my name is Scott Pilkington and I'll be your MC for the evening. The Cafe Scientific series is brought to you by the Auckland Museum Institute, the Auckland branch of the Royal Society, Te Aparangi. We have a few admin and housekeeping things to run through before we get started, which also allows any latecomers to come in too. We will be muting everyone's microphones and have disabled screen sharing. If you'd like to ask any questions, please drop them down below in the chat. The chat is already going off, so just click on the thing that's uh, bouncing up on your screen and type in all your questions and comments. We are recording the first portion of tonight's presentation and it will appear on YouTube sometime next week, so catch it out there. You're welcome to have your camera on if you wish. Uh, this does help our speaker. It's a lot easier to present to uh, a screen of faces that are smiling and nodding than, uh, than a blank screen that's just reflecting back yourself. However, if your screen is on, there is a chance that you will end up in the recording. If you'd rather not appear in the recording, please just turn your camera off. So first thing that we're gonna cover though is we have a range of exciting events planned for you this year. Uh, and I'm just going to run through the ones that are, that are in the first half of the year so that we get a taste of what is coming. So, of course, first thing that we have um, up on the list is tonight's cafe, a deadly dance when black holes and neutral stars collide with Dr. Dr. Eloise Stevens. Uh, that is tonight. We're about to hear that. You already know. Next month, 27th of April, uh, the Café Scientifique is Ancient Futures, late 18th and early 19th century Tongan arts and their legacies with Dr. Phyllis Herder and Dagmar Vaikalafi Deek uh, at the University of Auckland. Apologies if I pronounce any part of your name uh, wrong there, Dagmar. Um, so that is in April 27th. Look forward, that is next month. Look forward to seeing you. Then in May, we've got two events. First up, we've got our first conversazione for the year. If you don't know what a conversazione is, don't worry, more information will be coming out. There'll be information online as well. <clears throat> but we've got Margaret Durling, who is the Vice President of the Auckland Museum Institute. She's been doing some research. She's been digging around, trying to find out who were the other Cheesemans. We know who Thomas Cheeseman was. He was Director of Auckland Museum for a long time. He was heavily involved in science, technology, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but so were other parts of his family, predominantly his sisters, who often went unacknowledged in the work that they did. So Marguerite is going to be telling us all about the other Cheesemans. The second thing that we have in May is another cafe. Uh, Associate Professor Kat Bolstead, everybody's favorite squidologist is back. Squidology 102, the real weirdos. Cause you know, giant squid is so 2019. So Kat has very glad, uh, kindly decided to come back and talk to us. And I'm so glad that we're only seeing pictures of squid and that we don't have to actually smell them. Uh, thank you, Kat. In June, we have Dr. Dan Hukaroff from the University of Auckland. He's going to be presenting on Matariki. What is Matariki anyway? An introduction to Matariki, Matamataka, and Maturanga. So uh, look forward to that. And then, of course, in June and this uh, in July, and this slide is already wrong because it is Tuesday, the 5th of July, not the 12th. Um, we have our first ever humanities lecture, the Auckland Museum Institute. Humanities Lecture and inaugural speaker is Dr. Vincent O'Malley uh, presenting The Great War for New Zealand and the Making of Auckland. Now, more information about that. This is just a teaser. More information will be coming out by email. If you, you won't get this e the email about this event, however, unless you are an Auckland Museum Institute member. We'll cover more of that in just a moment, but you do need to be a member. Also in July, rounding off the, the first half of the year, we have Dr. Annette Semadini Davies, who is going to, who's from NIWA and going to be talking about catchment modeling for water quality and what they can and can't tell us. Uh, so look forward to that 27th of July. Hopefully by then we'll be back in the pub uh, at Horse and Trap so that we can uh, talk about that uh, in person. Of course, a reminder, the Cafe Scientific is brought to you by the Auckland Museum Institute, uh, the Auckland branch of the Royal Society Te Aparangi. Now, to be, to be invited to really cool things like the museum medals uh, and a bunch of other things, including the inaugural uh, Auckland Museum Institute Humanities Lecture, you need to be an Auckland, member, Auckland Museum Institute member. How do you join? If you aren't already a member, head over to aucklandmuseum.com, click on membership, scroll down a bit till you get the different options and click on Auckland Museum Institute. It should look a bit like this. So with all of that sorted, uh, a warm welcome to all of you tonight. Thank you for coming. We've got 34 people uh, in the room right now. Um, we're now going to please give a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Eloise Stevans, better known to some of you perhaps as Dr. Nova, who was also the most recent 
Beatrice Tinsley lecturer. So tonight, uh, Dr. Stevens is going to be talking to us about their research into neutron stars and black holes. Please, everyone give them a warm welcome as we hand over so they can start their presentation now. No pressure. It should be working. Can I get a nod? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, to let me be the, the first the first speakers of the Cafe Scientific this year. It's good timing uh, because I'm leaving the country very soon, so I wouldn't have been able to do the other ones. But regardless, um, for uh, those of you that have not seen my Beatrice Tinsley lecture, uh, that's great because this is basically a 20 minute version of it. And I'm going to be talking about black holes and neutron stars and what happens when they collide, because they're not just rare events, they're also incredibly extreme and weird, but they still have an impact on life as we know it. So first quick rundown, neutron stars and black holes are um, just the corpses of massive stars, just casually. Uh, if you've got a massive star that is born with more than eight times the mass of the sun, um, it will explode as a supernova at the end of its life and it's going to leave behind either a black hole or a neutron star. Now, black holes typically are more than five times the mass of the sun. Usually the divide between the neutron stars and the black holes is around three, but most of them are more than five times the mass of the sun. That is not a law of physics. That is just to do with how they're born. And they are the densest object in the universe, so dense, in fact, that even light cannot escape them. Now, our neutron stars are a little bit less dense, so they can shine. Light can uh, just about... Um, come out of these objects, but they are still very dense. They can pack between one and three times the mass of the sun into an object the size of a city, which is a little difficult to picture because it is very extreme. So a good analogy is if one of your red blood cells, just one of these red blood cells was made of neutron star material, it would weigh about as much as, as Donald Trump. Um, and you've got to admit that's, that's pretty dense as far as things go. So neutron stars, extremely dense objects. Now, our neutron stars and our black holes um, come from massive stars, which are very often born with siblings. They have friends. They're very often in binary systems. Sorry for the jingle. Those are my keys that I'm moving away. And that's one of the things we specialize in at the University of Auckland. We simulate binary stars. We predict what's going to happen throughout their lives. Now, because uh, binary star systems, the massive ones, tend to have massive siblings as well, they can give us binary neutron stars, binary black holes, and that's great. The problem is in order to get those neutron stars and those black holes, you need to go through the supernova explosion. And supernova explosions are no trifling matters. They can release as much energy in one event as the sun will release in its entire 10 billion year lifetime. They eject the outer parts of the star at speeds of 10,000 kilometers per second. And that's just 1% of 1% of the total energy of our supernova. And so because they're so powerful, they can give a kick to our newborn neutron star, our new black hole as well. Uh, and that kick can have an influence on the system as a whole. It can bring the two stars closer together and can push them further away. It can disrupt the binary entirely because that kick has speeds of about a few hundreds of kilometers per second, which we know because we can observe neutron stars in the galaxy and measure their velocities. So it's not just something we've kind of hypothesized, uh, it's something we can actually measure. Now, if you can survive to supernovae and you don't get disrupted and your neutron stars are nice and close together, um, then, then what? How do you go from that to actually two objects that merge? How do you bring them together? Well, it's to do with how heavy they are and how they warp the fabric of space-time around them. Now, anything that has a mass in the universe warps the fabric of space-time space to an extent, but things as dense as neutron stars and black holes warp the fabric of space-time dramatically. They cause this little funnel. It's a funnel in two dimensions. Obviously, space-time is a four-dimensional object, a lot harder to draw, you might admit, so we're going to keep to two dimensions. And we think of that funnel as you know, the, this little hole that things can fall into. And if it's just an object on its own, the entrance of that funnel of that hole is round and nice and symmetrical. But if you have two objects that are really close together, then their funnels sort of merge together and you get this weird peanut shape. 
And as they orbit around each other, this peanut shape is going to stir the fabric of space-time. And there's a very good visualization for it on YouTube. This guy strapped two wheels to a drill and is then making them spin over a piece of literal fabric. And we're going to actually see that motion in slow motion. And you can see these waves being created and then um, rippling out. And it's the same thing that happens with what we call gravitational waves. Uh, it creates these waves that then ripple out through the fabric of space-time. And these waves need energy. In the case of the drill and the wheels, well, the energy comes from the electricity in the battery of uh, the drill and it gets drained over time. In the case of our binary black holes, the energy comes from the orbital energy. So what does it mean for orbital energy to be taken away from a star system? Well, it means that as they orbit around each other, our stars are going to come closer and closer and closer together until they merge. That's what causes that merger. But those gravitational waves are also going to ripple out, as I said, and they're going to encounter the Earth at some point, which means that they're going to uh, wiggle, wibbly wobble spacetime at the location of the Earth. Now, it's a slightly more subtle uh, effect, but it is something that we can now measure. Now, measuring gravitational waves is, um, is not a simple endeavor. It's taken absolute decades for people to figure it out. It takes a lot of technology, a lot of brain power. So we're going to break it down to its most essential components so that it fits into my talk. You're going to do things. You're going to need lasers and special mirrors. Your mirrors are special because they are completely free to move, yet they are completely isolated from every motion on Earth. So if there's a lorry driving by two kilometers away or some seismic motion uh, from the Earth, these mirrors completely isolated and don't move. That's because you want these mirrors to wobble only when the fabric of space-time wobbles with them, right? But how are we going to see if the mirrors have moved? That's where the laser comes in. So the laser, is shone, shot out, uh, split it in two beams that go towards our mirrors that are the same distance apart. And then the laser bounces back, bounces back, the beam reunites, goes to the detector. And what's very special with lasers is that it's only one color, only one wavelength of light. So the peaks and the troughs in the light are always in the same place as you, as you expect them to be, unless your mirror has moved unexpectedly. In that case, the peaks and the troughs wobble as well, and that causes what we call interferences in the light when the two beams join together, because the peaks and the troughs are not where they're supposed to be anymore. And that's where the detector is actually going to measure those interferences. So these um, uh, gigantic instruments are called interferometers for a reason, um, and they have to be extremely large in order to be able to measure the subtle movement that they're trying to detect. So in America, uh, uh, each arm is of order two kilometers, and it's similar for uh, the, the ones in Italy and, and now in India. Now, it's not the only thing that's big. The mirror is big too. <laughs> and the mirror is, uh, is here and you can see it's on this pendulum that helps isolate it from um, any kind of noise and motion that you might have on Earth, Earth, vibrations of any kind. And the reason you need such high level technology is because the wobble you're trying to detect is of order a thousand times smaller than an atomic nucleus. It's a thousand times smaller than the building blocks of everything around us which is mind boggling. It's, it's one of those things where uh, technology is sufficiently advanced that it, it, it does uh, feel like magic. But we can detect these gravitational waves. We've been doing it since 2015. That's when the first observation of a, a black hole merger that you know, gave us these gravitational waves was observed in, um, in the before times. <laughs> Before before Brexit, uh, before Trump became president, and uh, when having Corona was actually a good thing. I was a wee PhD student when that happened, so when I say we detected, I mean that in the raw sense of the term, very much so. Uh, but that object is called GW150914. We do love our phone numbers in astronomy, but it's just a date. That's all it means. It's just a date, 2015, September 14th. And that's what the signal looked like. There were two detectors at the time, two of these interferometers, one, uh, both in America, but separated by some fair distance apart. 
And that's the wave that they saw. And you can notice that the strength of that wave increases over time. That's a time axis over here. And yes, those are fractions of seconds. And the peaks and the troughs come closer together over time as well. That's the frequency increasing. That's what this plot shows. It shows you the frequency going up and that shirt when whoop, just kind of like when you do play with sound things, I guess. That's, that, there's a, a lot of analogies to sound and gravitational wave physics, trying to make it relatable to people. Um, but yeah, that's what the gravitational wave looks like. And the reason that the strength increases and the frequency increases is because those black holes are coming closer and closer together. So they're spinning faster and faster around each other um, and making uh, larger gravitational waves. Now, what's really cool is that the observations and the theory match really nicely. And when your theory and your observations match really nicely, it means you can interpret your observations and get physical properties out. It means they can tell you what the masses of these black holes were, the black holes that came together and the black holes, the black hole that they formed. So in this particular event, you had a 35 solar mass black hole merged with a 30 solar mass black hole to make a 62 solar mass absolute beast of a black hole. Now, for those of you that are still paying attention, you might notice that if you add 35 and 30, it does not make 62. We are missing three solar masses. Where have they gone? Well, these three solar masses worth of matter have been turned into energy as they merged to create the last drags of gravitational waves that came out of this, of this event. It's, it's a tremendous amount of energy. And when this event happened, it was the most brightest in the sense of energy event in the in the entire universe. Now, since 2015, we've observed uh, nearly 100 black holes by now. So this is the, the stellar graveyard, LIGO, Virgo, those uh, detectors update this plot regularly. And it's a nice plot. It's really pretty. And it's only got one axis, which makes it quite easy to read. So you've got solar masses on the y-axis, one solar mass here, 200 solar masses here. Notice that it's not a linear scale. It's a little messed up so that it looks nice. And then the x-axis is nothing. It, they just put the shapes in an order that makes it look kind of, symmetri kind of symmetrical. What's cool here is the blue shapes are the black holes that have been observed through gravitational waves since 2015. And the red ones was the black holes that we knew about pre-2015. So since this technology has started working, we've completely revolutionized how we uh, um, study black holes and what we know about their masses. That is the primary way that we can learn about them. Because it's very difficult to see a black hole through a normal telescope since it does not give up any light. Now, when it comes to neutron stars, uh, which is the other two colors on this plot, the yellow and the orange, um, they are also observable through gravitational waves. You know, we can see neutron star mergers, but they are harder to see because they don't wobble the fabric of space time quite as much. But we've seen a handful. And um, in the last part of this talk, I'm going to tell you about the first binary neutron star measure that we've observed through gravitational waves, because it was also the most interesting. And it's one that I've, I've been studying for a bit. It's called GW 170817, which means it was observed on the 17th of August 2017. And um, now, when you're observing things that are less massive than those black holes, a bit harder to tell sometimes the mass. So we've got some idea of the masses of the neutron stars, but it's not independent. If you change one, you'll have to change the other. It's complicated mass. Uh, I can talk more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. We know what they gave out. It's a 2.74 solar mass black hole. Now, what's really cool when your neutron stars come together is because they're made of matter that can shine, they're a little bit more dramatic than binary black hole mergers and a little bit more interesting. And to get an idea of why, uh, we've got a simulation here that's going to show you two neutron stars in slow motion coming together. Don't worry too much about the colors, it's probably just density, but you'll see that as they're rotating around each other and they start merging, they're not going to collide head on because they're spinning. They're going to spiral into each other, and as they do, they're going to slingshot material out into space. They're going to form this torus, this uh, uh, red donut around the hypermassive neutron star, which is the yellow thing. Now, that's still a neutron star for now because it's spinning quickly, but when it loses that rotation, it's too massive to, to stay a neutron star. It's going to collapse to a black hole. Oh, that was good timing. And that donut um, also creates jets um, in, uh, bipolar, in, in a, a perpendicular direction from, from, from the torus. Uh, and then the blue cloud 
uh, is going to go out into space and over the next few days start shining. So our binary neutron star merger does a few things. It gives us gravitational waves, which we've been talking about. It gives us a jet of gamma rays, which we can also observe if we're in the right direction. So if you're around here, you might, you're not going to see the gamma rays. If you're here, you're going to see it. Um, and it gives us what we call a kilonova, which is that cloud of particle things being created, that ejector, uh, that uh, messy stuff that it, it, it slingshot out into space. That stuff is highly radioactive, and radioactive stuff in space tends to glow, and you can hope to see it. Now, in the case of 170817, um, oh, well, I'm going to skip that because I don't want to talk about it. We can do that in the Q&A. Um, in the case of 170817, we saw the gravitational wave. Uh, we got that chirp, you see that chirp, uh, but uh, only in two detectors. We didn't see it in the third detector we had at the time, Virgo, which was a good thing because it's not that Virgo was not listening. It's that Virgo um, happened to have this object in its blind spot, which dramatically constrained uh, the guess area um, uh, of, its, of its source on the sky. That's the sort of area that the gravitational wave people uh, give us the you know, optical astronomers, and, and they're like, okay, there might be something shiny in this uh, in this spot. You should go check it out. So people went to check it out, and they got a gamma ray burst, which is nifty. You can see the chirp happening in. That's where the merger happens. And then in under two seconds, that torus forms. You launch the jets, and bam, you can see it right there, big burst. But the other thing that people were able to find is the actual kilonova and its galaxy. This is uh, the picture they got of, well, it's called 82,017 GFO. Uh, it's the name of the light that corresponds to 170817. And this picture is actually a GIF. You can see August 22nd, how bright it is, August 26th, August 28th. That light fades extremely quickly, very, very quickly. In the reddest colors, that's infrared stuff, that's actually red. It's in blue because it's the blue color, I guess, in this area. Um, it peaks uh, in the optical colors, it, it peaks in less than a day. And then in the redder colors, it peaks in a few days and then starts fading, which means that you're on the clock when you're trying to find those. You really need a small uh, guess area in order to find them. But we found this one. And the reason that's really awesome is because for people like me that study stellar evolution and how stars die and what they look like when they die and their, and their neighbors, if you give me a galaxy, then I can guess their age and the chemical composition, which tells me about the age and the chemical composition of the parent system. So I'm going to show you a really scary graph um, because it's, um, it's, it's something I uh, spent two years doing uh, and it's in a, it's a little bit less nicely formatted because it's for a, an actual paper. So it's very squiggly indeed. Those squiggles are my squiggles. They're my favorite squiggles. And what they tell you is how much light there is in each color from that galaxy. We've got blue light here, red light over here. And all of these squiggles are made by the stars that um, are in that galaxy. The, the sum of the light of all of these stars creates this, what we call spectrum. And in order to figure out what stars uh, cause that light, how old they are, um, what kind of chemical enrichment they have, what I do is that I take our models and then I put models together until I reproduce the squiggle as best as I can. And so what I found is that there are two key populations in this galaxy. First, a relatively old and metal poor, as in it's not got as many heavy elements as the sun uh, population, and that's 95% of the mass in that galaxy. And that's the most likely uh, origin of this merger. And there's also a young metal rich component, which is not super important in this case. But the good thing about having this information is that then I can use that and the knowledge I have about the mass of neutron stars from LIGO Virgo, and then I can go into our models and I can match up all the models that, um, um, that give me the same characteristics. And then I can rewind the tapes and I can tell you what their parents look like and what their life looked like. So for this object, uh, a likely explanation, although there's a lot more stuff that goes into the paper, is that it started uh, five to seven billion years ago as a 15 solar mass around a 12 solar mass. And they had a really crazy life because 
uh, when the stars started dying, the, the, they were so close together, they enveloped their friend and then they lost their uh, outer shell and then they might have transferred mass between the two stars again before exploding as a supernova, leaving a neutron star. Um, and then the other one goes through this common envelope phase where it engulfs its friend, loses its uh, outer envelope, um, maybe transfers more mass, explodes as a supernova, becomes a binary neutron star merger, and then five billion years later, merges and gives us 170817 and makes astronomers go crazy. All right, so um, thank you very much for listening. That's exactly 20 minutes. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions and also big thanks to all of my colleagues that have been amazing um, over the past few years. Thank you so much. Huge round of applause uh, from all of us from our individual homes to Dr. Stevans uh, for that amazing cafe. While they take a quick moment to have uh, a little something to, to drink and to rest their vocal cords for just a moment, uh, going to quickly plug, uh, if you would like to join our newsletter mailing list and get monthly reminders of uh, events as they, that are coming up so that you get a nice little reminder and you don't forget, uh, I have dropped in the chat below. If you're watching this on YouTube, it is down in the description, uh, a link to our online form where you can sign up for our newsletters. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, that the end of the video will be in just a second. Thank you so much for tuning in and checking out our, our cafe this month. Uh, and if you are in the Zoom call, we will proceed with Q&A in just a minute. Thank you very much. And back over to Dr. Stabance.